Without St. John's Bread and Life, more than 6,000 people wouldn't have a Thanksgiving. I'm Jessica Easthope with how the organization is keeping people fed and hopeful this holiday. Help could soon be on the way for people in public housing living without heat or a way to cook for their families. This weekend, Cardinal designate Wilton Gregory of Washington will be the first African American to ever be given the red hat. Plus, kicking off the tablet's annual Bright Christmas campaign to help kids in the diocese. The news starts right now. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. St. John's Bread and Life serving meals to their neighbors in Brooklyn and Queens. Hello, I'm Christine Persichetti. Now more than ever, St. John's Bread and Life is serving those in need. Since the pandemic, the number of people having trouble putting food on the table has grown exponentially. And this Thanksgiving, they expect to feed thousands. Current News' Jessica Easthope is in Bed-Stuy with more. Calling 2,436. At St. John's Bread and Life, feeding those in need is a numbers game. 70,000. That's the number of pounds of food that's been given out this week ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah. Next. 3,000, the number of meals served every single day. That's been quadrupled during the pandemic. A lot of people who never expected to be on our lines are on our lines asking for help. And you know, you see the fear in people's faces. You know, like, what do I do? You guys got enough stuff? For sister Caroline Tweedy, the executive director of St. John's Bread and Life, staying ahead of the numbers and the need is what makes the soup kitchen successful. Every bag that goes out to a person has 32 pounds of food. When it comes to the bread, they have it covered. But in recent months, the life part of their mission has been challenging. The one thing that really is missing for us is that sense of community. You know, people could come in and have a meal, go to a movie. We can't do any of that. The day before Thanksgiving, staff and volunteers, a team that's been severely cut down for social distancing, is working double time. I have social workers who are handing out food and case managers who are stuffing bags. Everybody is doing their part. They all have the same goal. Thank you. To help people like Rebecca Crowley. It's a blessing to make sure that my children don't go to bed hungry. I did make sure I brought all three birth certificates. That Rebecca lucky. and her veteran husband both lost their jobs during the pandemic. With three young kids at home, Rebecca relies on St. John's Bread and Life to make Thanksgiving special. It's the best feeling in the world. To be able to make a meal, knowing you came here, and my kid, you know, and, and put it down in front of my family, and my kids look at me, thank you so, I mean, just the look in their eyes. This Thanksgiving, the pandemic isn't stopping St. John's Bread and Life from showing people they still care. 6,000 is the number of people they'll feed and the number of reasons to have hope. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. In Bedford-Stuyvesant, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. If you'd like to help St. John's Bread and Life, go to breadandlife.org and click on Donate. Over in Jamaica Estate, students are doing their part to feed the hungry. This might be the only meal somebody is eating today. Mm -hmm. And to make... The Immaculate Conception Catholic Academy teaming up with one sandwich at a time to make over 600 sandwiches for those in need. The local nonprofit gathers monthly to make, bag, and deliver sandwiches to shelters throughout the city. Hundreds of families struggling during the pandemic already have their turkeys, thanks to Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens. More than 900 turkeys and food vouchers were given out last week so everyone can celebrate the holidays. The annual giveaway being held this year at St. Francis of Assisi St. Blaise Parish in Prospect Lefferts Gardens in Brooklyn and at the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Convent in Queens. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says public schools, which have been closed since the city hit a 3% positivity rate last week, will reopen under a rollout plan to be announced next week. Every child will have to have a consent form on file because testing will be more frequently. Right now, the norm in the schools has been once a month. That's going to increase. We're going to work out the exact amount, but that's going to increase. The mayor says the rolling plan will begin with special needs students and elementary school children. Meanwhile, a judge has ruled in favor of Catholic schools in a case against the New York City Department of Education. 
Public schools must now provide COVID-19 testing for Catholic school students. This weekend, the Vatican will welcome 13 new cardinals into the church. The men coming from different corners of the globe will not only add some new perspectives to the College of Cardinals, they will change up the very makeup of the consistory. Claudia Torres tells us more. On November 28th, Pope Francis will celebrate his seventh consistory, in which he'll appoint 13 new cardinals. Only nine of them will be allowed to participate in a future conclave. The other four will not be allowed to vote because they are over 80 years old. The College of Cardinals would be made up of 128 electors and 101 non-electors. That surpasses the limit of 120 voters that Paul VI established in 1975. Before the upcoming consistory was announced, the College of Cardinals was made up of 119 electors, only one below the limit. That's what makes this particular consistory intriguing, as normally the Pope would wait for there to be more vacancies before naming new cardinals. This isn't the first time it happens, however. For example, in 2001, under John Paul II, the number of electors rose to 135. Preghiamo per i nuovi cardinali affinché confermando la loro adesione a Cristo mi aiutino nel mio ministero di vescovo di Roma per il bene di tutto il santo popolo fedele di Dio. Since his election, Pope Francis has been restructuring the College of Cardinals. It can now be considered much more universal. After the November consistory, he will have had elected 57% of its 229 total members. That means 95 cardinals will have been named by Pope Francis, 69 by Benedict XVI, and 65 by John Paul II. Francis has chosen cardinals from remote regions instead of from traditional places like Venice and Milan. He's preferred a college of cardinals more representative of Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and less of Europe. Now, Asia, Africa, and Latin America will make up 45% of the college. That percentage was at 35 for the conclave that elected Pope Francis. Representatives from Latin America after this consistory will make up 18.5% of the college, while those from Africa and Asia will hold the highest percentage in history, with Africa making up 14%, an increase from the 9% that saw Pope Francis elected, and Asia 12% instead of its previous 9%. The conclave that elected Pope Francis was 52% European, but after the November consistory, that number will go down to 41%. It's the lowest percentage of European representatives at a conclave. The percentage of Italian cardinals has also been reduced to 17%, what it was during John Paul II's pontificate. After the November consistory, the United States will make up only 7% of the college, its lowest number in decades. Again, that was Claudia Torres reporting. Among the 13, there will be a historic milestone for the church. Cardinal designate Wilton Gregory will be the first African American to ever be given the red hat. Current News Jessica Easthope has more on the historic announcement and its huge impact. Terro un concistoro per la nomina di 13 nuovi cardinali. A groundbreaking papal announcement. 13 new cardinals, among them the first African-American cardinal ever named, Washington, D.C. Archbishop Wilton Gregory. It's really just such a, a wonderful moment for the African-American Catholic community. Father Alonzo Cox, the director of the Ministry to African-American Catholics in the Diocese of Brooklyn, says the historic announcement shows him the Holy Father is paying attention to the racial climate in the country. The Holy Father is really looking at what's happening in our world and it's just you know, trying to, to show us and to tell us that, you know, these men um, will uh, be strong voices in the church to help us uh, grow as a community of believers. Cardinal designate Gregory has already made his mark on the church. In 2002, as president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, he spearheaded the Dallas Charter, addressing the sexual abuse of minors by Catholic clergy. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio says as the church moves forward, he believes Cardinal Designate Gregory will work toward amending the Dallas Charter. Uh, the Dallas Charter, again, is almost 20 years old now, and something that needs to be looked at. I mean, it's not, not perfect. I'm not sure if he's still working with the conference. He'll be a, he'll be a great voice in helping us understand why we did what we did then and how we can move on to the future. Of the 37,000 Catholic priests in the United States, only 250 are African American. I think young African American uh, men will look to him as an example of this is what I could 
drive for one day. And I think he would be uh, a great example uh, for vocations within our community. As Cardinal Gregory, Bishop DiMarzio believes he will elevate the culture of African-American Catholics through representation. It's important that people see reflected in the, in the hierarchy their own needs and concerns of their own people. So I think that's a, a very positive thing. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Another devoted priest getting his red hat, Silvano Tomasi, who has been a huge voice on the issue of migration. Bishop Nicholas Tomasio worked with Cardinal Designate Tomasi for years and considers him a good friend. I worked with him uh, since 1972. He was the founder of the Center for Migration Studies in Staten Island, and I think it shows that the Holy Father is very interested in the issue of migration because that he's devoted his whole life so that study. Bishop DiMarzio is now the president of the board of the Center of Migration Studies. He called Cardinal Designate Tomasi to congratulate him on the appointment. Net TV will be airing the consistory in full all weekend. You can catch the ceremony this Saturday, November 28th at 3 p.m. and this Sunday, November 29th at 4 p.m. There's a lot more news headed your way. Gas, heat, hot water, electricity. Every year we hear stories of NYCHA residents having to do without these basic utilities. But a new bill is trying to help. I'm Emily Druby and I'll have the story. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas in St. Peter's Square in Rome. And the Bright Christmas campaign is now underway. How you can help the tablet's annual effort to help kids across the diocese. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Rent relief could be on the way for those who live in public housing. This after hardships caused by the pandemic and some utility outages. Currents News, Emily Druby speaks with one woman who says she could use the help. This sound is music to Sylvia's ears. The NYCHA resident went months without being able to cook for her family because of a building-wide gas outage. I thought it was only for a week or two weeks, but when I see it, it was a month and next month and two months and almost four months with that problem. She was given a hot plate. Her priest and longtime housing advocate, Father Edward Mason, says it's not enough. It's not something you're gonna cook a meal on for a family of, of, of people. So I mean, it's just, it's terrible. The outage meant Sylvia had to spend. She bought this $150 cooker and many pre-made meals. I was worried because it's not easy to buy food every time, every day, almost three days, uh, 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 three times a day, because I have kids. Sylvia is not alone. NYCHA consistently making headlines for long utility outages. It's a problem Father Mason sees often. It was my first thought a couple of years ago, the first time I saw this happen with the family, was, you know, they were actually asking to borrow money uh, from me to help um, pay their food, buy their food. And I said, they should be paying less in rent. New York State Senator Michael Giannaris had the exact same idea. This would not be tolerated in a private residence. Why should NYCHA be any different? Uh, uh, the residents of NYCHA should be treated the same as anyone else in the situation. Inspired by recent gas outages in Astoria, he introduced legislation that would cut rent for NYCHA residents experiencing utility outages, dropping it by 10% during the outage in hopes of easing the financial pressure on families like Sylvia's. Why should they be asked to be paying their full obligations uh, in rent when they're not getting the services that they're paying for? NYCHA is arguing this bill would hurt their ability to help, saying in a statement to Currents News, reducing or stopping rent payments would not speed up the process and would adversely affect NYCHA's ability to make repairs, as it would decrease NYCHA's day-to-day -day operating budget. Still, Senator Giannaris says he expects the bill to start making its way through the Senate and Assembly in January. Father Mason and Sylvia both welcome the idea of this relief. Emily Druby, Currents News. The pandemic isn't hampering the holiday spirit at the Vatican, which has started decorating for Christmas. Workers at St. Peter's Square are setting up a nativity scene with 54 statues and a 92-foot-tall Christmas tree. The inauguration ceremony will take place on December 11th, of course, with strict security measures in place. 
Visitors have until January 10th, the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, to see the display. Well, this is for you. Merry Christmas. You know through the tablet pretty much who the recipients are. Really makes it possible for young children to receive a little bit of the joy of Christmas. To make sure that families in need have a happy Christmas, particularly if they have young children, we're already attacking a problem. It's that time of year again. The Tablet's Bright Christmas campaign, which helps kids across the diocese, has begun. Editor-in-Chief Jorge Dominguez is here to tell us all about it. And Jorge, this campaign's been going on for more than half a century. And in less than 10 years, more than a million dollars has been donated across the diocese. So for people who may not know about it, you know, how did it start and what exactly happens? Oh, it started small, so many good things in life. Uh, Deacon Don Circle, he was the editor of the Tablet uh, for from the late 60s to the mid 80s, he had the idea in the late 60s, uh, you know, it was the, the time of the war on poverty and all these problems. Right. And they say, why we don't do something here in the diocese to help the kids from disadvantaged families, you know, uh, families who cannot celebrate Christmas because they, you know, we want every kid to celebrate Christmas. Right. So he started very small, but the, the campaign started to grow up. And then under Ed Wilkinson, he was in charge of the campaign, our uh, um, editor emeritus. Wow. And the reason for the campaign is always the same, but this year with the coronavirus, it's so much more important. Tell us what's at stake. Yeah, of course. The, the goal is always the same to, to the every kid in our diocese gets a gift or mm -hmm. have the, the opportunity to have a, a Christmas dinner or celebration. But this year, you know, we have been through the pandemic. Um, many families have lost fa family members, but also many, many of, uh, of our people have lost their jobs. Right. So uh, this is why this year the campaigns have the same goal for a new urgency. Okay, now we heard a little bit before about the Bright Christmas campaign, but let's hear more from others uh, about the good this money does. The Bright Christmas campaign supported our college readiness residential program as well as allowed us to get gifts for our scholars. It funds our college access programming which offers them SAT prep, ACT prep. For us, the Bright Christmas campaign really helps us personalize our programming a lot more and that's important when we're working with small groups of women who are really in need. So people really appreciate this. Tell us how much was raised last year and do we have a tally so far for this year? Yeah, by the way, uh, one of the things that I'm grateful in sense giving every year since I became the editor of the tablet is the generosity of people toward the campaign. Right. Uh, last year we, we, uh, we, we raised uh, $106,000. This year we just started, but we have our first $500. You know, the generosity is there and people always help us so much. I want to remind everybody that the sooner you send your donation to the Bright Christmas campaign, the sooner we can give the money to the parties and to the programs and to the kids. Right, exactly. So how can people at home donate? Well, it's, it's very easy. You can just uh, write a check and send it to the Tablet Bright Christmas campaign, 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11 to 15. Or you can uh, donate through PayPal in our website. You go to thetablet.org and you are going to see there you know, the link to donate. All right, so it makes it easy for everyone at home. Jorge Dominguez, Editor-in-Chief of the Tablet Newspaper. Thanks so much, and we'll keep checking in with you. Thank you for having me, and happy Thanksgiving. Still to come on Currents News, sending cheer to those serving who can't be home for Christmas. The idea that one teen had to make sure that happens. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number, 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Pandemic travel restrictions have been tough on everyone who's away from their family during the holidays. But it's been especially tough on a teen in Rockland County who hasn't seen his older sister Sam in over a year. She's in the U.S. Army stationed in Italy and they don't know when she'll be able to come home next. Trey Rolnick joins us now to tell us how he's trying to make sure Sam and her fellow soldiers still have 
a Merry Christmas. And Trey, first tell me, what's it like being apart from your sister for so long, especially not being able to see her around Thanksgiving and Christmas? I mean, it's very hard and disappointing because my sister is honestly my best friend and I've done everything with her. So it's really sad that I haven't been able to see her in a year and that now I'm not going to be able to see her for the holiday season, which is a very family oriented time for me. Sure, it's so sad. Now you started a GoFundMe to send Sam and her fellow soldiers some Christmas cheer. Tell us how you came up with that idea. Well, last year after Christmas, because that was the first Christmas I have endured with her in a different country. So I asked her how she was doing and what her soldiers got for Christmas. And she told me that they weren't as fortunate as she was, which it broke my heart, honestly, because they do so much for us that I thought it was time to give back. So this year, when I thought about what happened with COVID, it would be very nice to spread them some gifts and holiday cheer. Absolutely. And what kind of things do the soldiers need? What are some of the things you're sending with the money you raise? So far, we are sending uh, blankets that are military approved, um, some toiletries, so toothbrushes, um, shampoos and conditioners, uh, shower gels, and just some other basic necessities. Yeah, because I know they're in Italy, which has some of the strictest lockdowns, so they probably haven't been able to get much of that stuff. What has your sister said about what you're doing? My sister, and she's spoken to me about it, and she's honestly very, she's proud of me. And it means a lot to know that she loves it and that I'm making a difference for her and her soldiers. Aww. So how can people at home get involved, and what's your deadline? So we currently have a GoFundMe up, Operation Santa, Sam Soldiers, and we are currently collecting money. If you could... You don't even have to donate, but helping to spread the word just means so much. And our deadline is this Sunday. All right, Trey Rolnick and your Operation Santa. Thanks so much for joining us and good luck. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great Thanksgiving. So again, if you'd like to donate to the soldiers stationed in Italy, head on over to GoFundMe.com and search for Operation Santa, Sam's Soldiers. The deadline to donate again is Sunday, November 29th. Rockefeller, the owl, is back home in the wild. The tiny bird who was discovered in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree was released into her natural habitat on Tuesday. Rockefeller, as she's now known, was dehydrated and hadn't eaten for days when she was found in the tree. But after being taken care of at the Ravensbeard Wildlife Center in upstate New York, she is now flying free. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. We won't be here on Thursday or Friday, but we just want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Hope to see you again next time.